Hi everyone, this is Peter with the last part on um, on Italian Baroque painting and for this segment I want to talk a little bit about ceiling painting. When we last uh, left off we were looking at Anibale Caracci's uh, Loves of the Gods in the Galleria of Palazzo of Farnese. And I talked a little bit about the degree to which that really kind of marks a culmination or uh, possibly even a cessation of the idea of the great uh, fresco cycle tradition that had been happening uh, since the time especially of uh, Giotto going back to the Arena Chapel around 1305. Um, that's not to say though that fresco painting is done as a sort of creative mode of expression. In fact far from it and in this talk I wanted to spend a few minutes talk, uh, discussing some uh, examples that are worth uh, worth paying attention to. Um, one of these is certainly uh, the work of uh, one of these examples is the work of Guido Reni. Uh, Guido Reni is um, a great example of the influence that the Karachi uh, Art Academy and family had upon, um, especially upon more official, bigger um, uh, commissions in uh, the Roman artistic tradition at the beginning of uh, the 17th century. Um, what we're looking at here, and, and the fresco is titled Aurora, so basically referring to sunrise, is an overtly classicized, really borrowing from classical, uh, literally motifs and, and objects, a classicized rendition of a mythological theme, um, to the viewer in a kind of freeze uh, uh, format, freeze, F-R-I-E-Z-E, -E, meaning a band of figures moving horizontally. Um, you know, across the across the, the field, uh, the picture field. Um, the, the significant thing about this is the degree to which it really has um, no relation to its setting. The the fact is that a ceiling painting really needs to, at some uh, point, perhaps come in uh, or be seen in relation to its actual setting. Um, and there are ways in which, for instance, uh, the Sistine Chapel ceiling, to take that example, uh, plays with uh, its location. More explicitly, we can see in the Quadriportato scenes in Nibale Caracci's art, a deliberate attempt to illusionistically represent picture frames and yet put up on the ceiling scenes that look just like pictures. So, in other words, doesn't make a lot of sense to hang pictures on the ceiling, but Enable Karachi's done that, and I think quite deliberately to indicate this kind of tug of war contest between the idea of easel painting and fresco painting as the kind of thing that a you know a quote unquote real artist would do. So Guido Reni's definitely trading to some degree on the precedent set by um, uh, by Enable Karachi. Um, and, and really giving us a, a gorgeous scene that almost really would make more sense if it was set on a vertical wall rather than rather than a ceiling. Um, other artists see opportunities in taking that sort of understanding of the actual situation of the work of art and playing with that uh, to another level. And a good example of this in action is Pietro da Cortona's Triumph of the Barberini. This is a relatively secular work of art, although the Barberini are um, embedded in Roman politics and religion uh, to a considerable degree. Um, it is typically described to some degree as a as a piece of propaganda for the family, and I think I think that's pretty valid. But it really kind of uh, rises above that uh, in in some important regards. It inhabits a large vaulted curved vaulted ceiling in the so-called Gran Salone. A salone is a really big hall um, in a large palace, the Palazzo Barberini, and is deliberately intended to kind of evoke for a viewer within that interior space a, a vision looking up into heaven as though this spectacular array of figures and events is kind of unfolding overhead. And it's pretty clear the sources indicate that Pietro da Cortona worked with an advisor, an individual poet named Francesco Bracciolini, 
and there's a, really a guide to all of the individual um, sort of figures and their actions. Pro uh, prominent in all of this is a divine providence, this sense of a kind of divinely guided mission that raises the or purpose that raises the Barberini family to the very pinnacle of Roman politics and religion. Uh, Urban VIII being the, the classic example, the, the patron of Bernini as well. Um, uh, and, and so we have this list of, of uh, personages, uh, immortality with a crown of stars bestowing, you know, this eternal life and fame uh, on the Barberini. Uh, virtues, faith, hope, and charity, and of course papal symbols such as the tiara uh, and keys, and those are found, uh, you know, up here. And there are other things here: uh, uh, images of time, images of um, of just about every uh, nature. I'm trying to find in this. I think it's sort of cropped out, but enemies of the Barberini and such essentially cast down um, in a, a kind of echo of the, the falling of the damned. So Pietro da Cortona is put together using a style known as Soto in Su, S-O-T-T-O-I-N-S-U, uh, a scene that illusionistically projects uh, the narrative over the viewer's head. Probably the most uh, impressive example of this illusionistic tendency in painting is seen in the Church of San Ignacio in the glorification of St. Ignatius. And here we have not merely a kind of suggested um, impression of events overhead, but a, a deliberate construction of a perspectively correct architecture that uh, frames and guides uh, the scene and the viewer's eyes into a kind of heavenly realm, uh, literally uh, taking the roof off of the church itself. Um, and projecting skyward and a kind of tilting of that masterful uh, perspectival projection that we saw in uh, Raphael's School of Athens. Here, Ignatius is propelled into heaven, accompanied by scores and scores of figures. And again, these extraordinarily uh, accurate and carefully uh, executed architectural elements guiding the eye and providing uh, a sort of a stage, uh, much again like Raphael did uh, in the School of Athens. It's really quite a remarkable effect, and and for our purposes closes out the century, the 17th century quite nicely. It's hard to imagine how much farther, in literally, uh, and somewhat punningly, how much farther one can go in terms of uh, erasing uh, the line between illusion and real life in uh, two-dimensional painting. This is pretty much uh, also, interestingly enough, uh, the end of the line in terms of the uh, centrality of Italian painting. It marks uh, the end of a voyage uh, that we started again with the uh, achievements of the later 13th and early 14th century and phase out in the end of the 17th century. Increasingly, uh, through the 17th century into the 18th century, the art uh, and artists of Northern Europe, in particular France and the Low Countries, uh, will take precedent. 